thank you everyone who's taking the time to be here today for the B2G Victory and our Peace School Watch session on capability statements, your company's resume. Today, we're going to walk you through all of the components of a capability statement, as well as how to utilize that capability statement to further grow your business in the K through 12 space and government contracting. A little bit about B2G Victory. So we help clients win government contracts. We work with them to develop and create a unique capability statement. We help them with their certifications and recertifications, lead and capture management, proposal audits, registration, buyer interviews, training and coaching, and of course, responding to an RFP, RFQ. A little bit about me. I'm the co-founder of B2G Victory and I'm excited to be here. I've had over 25 years helping small businesses grow their capacity with government contracting, Fortune 500, um, as well as educational programs and networking events. My co-presenter today, Emily Kelly, is our project manager at B2G Victory. She's also known by the capabilities Erin or certification queen, depending on what she's working on. And her background is also helping small businesses grow their capacity. On the back end today is Dawn Dunsford and she's managing our Zoom, helping with the Q&A and the chat. And then here's the rest of our team. So it is, we're so excited that each of you have taken the time out of your very busy schedule so we're gonna go through a couple of different sort of housekeeping rules. Donna's dropping our contact information and throughout the program, we'll be dropping other links and information into the chat. When you have a question and your question is very important to us, we're asked that you drop that question in the Q&A. Either Don, Emily, or I will answer that question if it's one that we don't have an answer for, we're going to ask it out loud and let the RFP School Watch team answer that question. Now, if you want to go ahead and drop your contact information into the chat, let us know a little bit about you. I would love to know whether you have a capability statement currently. So go ahead and drop that information into the chat. And again, questions go in the Q&A box. As we're going through our session today, I want you to take a little bit of time and think about some things that you're going to be doing the rest of this week. And it's hard to believe, but this is the end of quarter one. Like 2023 is just flying through. So what are you gonna be doing in quarter two, quarter three, and quarter four? Government contract is a long marathon. It is not a sprint. It takes time, it takes patience, and it takes persistence. So start thinking about the things that you'll be doing in the next, throughout this year to help you grow your business. So remember, we've made things very easy for you because you're gonna go through this session and you're gonna go, I don't remember what she said about um, we're recording this. Next week, it's going to go up on our um, YouTube channel for you to go back in and review. So our YouTube channel has over probably right at 100 different videos. Some of them are the hour-long sessions, and some of them are very short snippets about specific topics. So we encourage you to go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel. When we hit that magic 500, we're going to do a drawing for a free capability statement. I think we're at 290. So we're all getting close. So go ahead and Dawn is dropping that information in um, for you uh, to go ahead and subscribe. 
Now, let's say you go through the session and you go, you know what? I need a capability statement now. We also have a discount, a $50 discount for you if you would like a capability statement now. So Don's dropping the instructions on how to get that. So you just email us with the with a code and all of that will be in the chat. Now, our relationship with RFP School Watch has been going on, for, I think, right at a little over two years. So we've been working sort of side by side, um, helping businesses gain government contracts. And so I'm going to pass this to Rick, but let me tell you something. If you're not familiar with RFP School Watch, trust me, they're going to save you a lot of time. All right, Rick. Good morning. Well, good afternoon. My name is Rick Bernstein. I've been with RFP School Watch for about two and a half years now. And my capacity statement is this. I am uh, very committed to customer service, saving my clients time, doing the extra legwork that they need done as often as we possibly can and assisting them with upgrading their keyword list, getting documents for uh, RFPs that are, not, that are not regularly attached to them and uh, just helping in any way that we can and helping them connect with uh, uh, B2G to assist them in their bid writing process. Welcome, it's a pleasure to be here and I will help with uh, questions at the end of the session as well, as much as I possibly can. Amy? Thanks, Rick. So my name is Amy Ball. I am um, a business development manager here at RFP School Watch. I've been here for five years, and um, I, too, help to customize accounts for new clients, uh, build robust keyword lists, um, and assist throughout their subscriptions to assist with uh, any changes that they need to make to their accounts. Um, you know, sometimes when you get started, your keywords may look a certain way because you're offering certain services or products, but over time, you may add new products or All right, I think we lost Amy, um, but she is, she is a great resource to have uh, when you're a member of RFP School Watch to help you upgrade uh, anything on your system. Are you back, Amy? I'm here. Okay, we both okay. Can a second. Okay, all right. So um, today we just wanted to um, take a few minutes and talk about how do we save our clients time. Um, so one of the first ways that we uh, save our clients time is we do the searching for you. Um, once your account is customized with us, uh, we monitor for your keywords um, every day and distribute those bids to you and your team every morning. Um, and because your bid opportunities are customized, um, it really cuts through the noise and gets you straight to the uh, bid opportunities that you're interested in and the ones that are valuable for your company. Um, the second way that we save our clients time is, is those, like I mentioned, those emails and bid opportunities are sent to you in a timely manner. We know that bid opportunities are time sensitive, um, especially since there are, you know, there are bid dates associated with these opportunities. So we make sure that we distribute these bids early in the morning and your team is able to start the day with these opportunities ready to go. Um, and the last point that we wanted to make is that we provide those documents to you as well. So our bid support team here is, um, they work around the clock to make sure that our clients have the bid documents they need to then pursue those opportunities. Um, and even if you're not pursuing those opportunities, the great thing is there's value in those bid opportunities and those documents. So just being able to extract that data from those bid documents um, is very valuable. And we're gonna make sure that you have those as well. So that's what we do. And that's how we save our clients time. And, you know, um, also the fact that, you know, a missed opportunity is very costly. So we wanna make sure that you know about every bid opportunity as they're posted each day. Susan? Right. Thank you, Amy. Mm -hmm. and. They're not only going to save you time, which is money, right? They also yes. have a promo code. If you are not part of RFP 
school watch i highly encourage that you check them out um, again they're going to get you opportunities straight in your inbox so that you're not having to search through all of the different school districts across the U.S. to find that perfect opportunity. So Don is dropping that promo code into the chat and then a place where you can sign up to see some sample bids to see what you're going to get. So again, this has been a great relationship. They are helping businesses. We're helping businesses. So we're proud to partner with them. All right. We're going to do our official first switch and Emily's going to come up and she's going to give you um, some information on what is a capability statement. Emily? Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I saw in the chat I was monitoring over there that some of you do have capability statements, probably about half and half right now, it looks like. Um, some, some are brand new to it, some already have them. So we're excited to talk to you about them today and uh, excited to, to hear your feedback on what you've learned if you already have one. So keep that information and feedback coming. So here's just a quick example of a capability statement. This is our capability statement, obviously. Um, it's just a great designed branded resource for you that we're gonna go into um, in great detail today, talk about the different elements and different components of what makes a really strong capability statement. So a capability statement is essentially your company's resume, right? Its purpose is to communicate to potential partners, stakeholders, suppliers, customers, and sometimes even your employees about your business and your capability statement. So it's your opportunity to really tell your story. And you tell your story in a couple of different ways with your business plan, your business model, and your business focus, right? These are all three unique pieces of the puzzle that makes your business it's your business, right? So what are the pieces of those three, um, your plan, your model, and your focus that make you unique? So we are going to look into those details. We're going to talk about those different pieces and how they help you tell your story and how that translates to your actual capability statement. So when we talk about capability statements, we like to break the components into five different sections, the identity, services, operations, your why you, and your experience. And we're going to go through those different components in a little bit of detail um, today. Through, uh, we're going to take turns breaking those apart. So first, though, who wants your capability statement, right? So we talked a little bit about what it is, but but why do we, why do we need one? Who's going to ask for one? What is the purpose of it? So these um, documents are going to be requested by Fortune 500 supplier diversity programs. Um, funding sources are going to want to hear your story. Again, it's a, a resume for your company. So you're out there selling your company. Um, what are the key pieces of information that people want to know when they're meeting you, when they're considering doing business with you? Additionally, prime contractors, if you're new to government contracting, um, Serving as a subcontractor to prime contractors might be a great way to get you in the door. They are looking to grow, build, and mentor small businesses, and they may have goals to meet. So a prime contractor is a perfect example of somebody who may want a copy of your capability statement to get a, a big picture of who you are and what you do. And last but certainly not least, government entities. Um, any type of government entity buyer is going to have a certain set of questions for you, right? There's going to be information that they want to know about you and about your business. So our goal is to get all of those key pieces into one place, and that's your capability statement. So when you're marketing to government entities, it can be a little different than what you may be used to in traditional marketing settings. They actually don't want a fancy brochure. They don't want your expensive custom uh, pocket folder full of inserts, and they don't want it here, visit my website. They are inundated with vendors and potential suppliers. They want something that looks sharp, that's concise, and that answers the questions that they have versus questions that you, know, you may use to just talk about your business in general. And working with a capability statement has a lot of benefits, right? It's a one-page document. It's branded to your business. So it tells your story. It helps identify you. And it's also easy to create an update. Businesses change, you grow, you add team members, right? You may add additional services. This document is a living, breathing document that really you should revisit every six months or so to make sure you're selling your business to the best of your ability, right? That you're putting your best foot forward. So it's easy to update. It's easy to, to use in different ways. It can be sent electronically, right? You can attach it to an email. You can pass it out in person. They're inexpensive to print because it's just one sheet on a nice piece of quality paper. So it, it bridges 
a lot of your marketing gaps, right? It, it's simple, it's quick and easy, and you can use it in a lot of ways and, and update it easily. And you can also have a couple different versions based on your service industry or salesperson. Perhaps you have two different branches of your business. And so you really need to focus on two different types of services. Or maybe you have a large sales team and your sales representatives are in different events. They're out across the community. They're doing things differently. So you might want to have a couple different versions with those sales managers on your document. It, again, it's an easy document. You build the basis of the business and then you can go in and update those individuals. Susan's going to talk a little bit more about how to do that here in just a minute. Um, we are getting ready to um, do our next switch, but I wanted to uh, remind you, please use the Q&A section for your questions, right? The Q&A will help us make sure we keep up with your questions. We don't lose you in the chat feed and we want to hear from you. Susan? All right, so we did have a question in the chat. So I am going to talk a little bit just briefly. Um, someone asked, how do you get to be a subcontractor? We will talk about that when we get to the marketing section. Um, so there are several different ways. So we, again, as we get to the marketing section, I'm gonna give you some uh, ways that you can get in front of subcontractors. Um, so we're gonna go back to the capability statement and I just wanted you to know, I saw the question, we will get it addressed um, in, that, in that part of the presentation. So our first component we're gonna talk about is identity. Kind of important to know who, as you're handing it out, the government entity wants to know who you are. So basic information, your contact information. So a little, little, and a little bit of inf additional information about that. I've probably reviewed 50, 60 capability statements and provided feedback. Out of the missing information, that is one of the ones that is most missed. They might have a generic email address on there or a website, but they're missing the actual contact piece of that. Who is somebody going to call? We're also going to go with tax ID, DUNS numbers, certifications, and social media. And we'll go through each of those briefly. So Henry at 4.0 GPA, um, this is his capability statement and his contact information. And one of the things you're going to notice is that we have a headshot for Henry on here. And that is something we started doing more and more, especially after COVID, um, because the buyers needed to see that face. They didn't get, they weren't out and about in the community. They were missing that personal touch. But you'll also notice that it is a professional headshot. So we have his contact information. Henry's also the face of the company in a lot of ways. He's been on several different TV shows talking about the services he provides to students leaving high school and into college. So he wanted to make sure that if people knew his name, they would recognize that when they gave, he gave them their capability statement. All right, so we're gonna go into tax ID and DUNS number. So this, again, that information that shows that you are a valid company. Here is my tax ID number. They know that, you know, you're gonna, have all your company do all the registrations that you need with the whatever state you're in. It also, um, if this is information when you're doing registrations on these school districts' websites that you're going to need. Now, Dunn's number shows that you have um, that information. It, it was at one time extremely important to have that because you had to have it to be registered in the system of awards management, which is a federal database. While it's not needed for that anymore, it's still important to have. So you can get a free DUNS number and you don't need to buy any additional service, but it does show that additional level of sophistication for your company. So Don, Oh, okay, we're going to talk about our geographic reach, our DUNS number. We did that. Let's just click on to the next slide. Don's going to drop the information on how to get a 
free DUNS number. Again, this is a free service. You do not have to buy anything additional to get this DUNS number. So keep that in mind. Somebody's going to try and sell you something. Just say no. We don't need it. All right. So certifications. There are different types of certifications that we're going to talk about. Some of those are those small business certifications. So that means that your company is either a minority or woman owned or veteran owned or service disabled veteran owned or just a small business designated or a disadvantaged business. It has all of those what we call acronym soup. Um, so that just you've gone through that process. Some school districts have small business programs. The Houston ISD is one of those that has a small business program. Um, and so those certifications may help you get into the door, but also certifications if you're out and about um, at a networking event where there are Fortune 500 companies, those certifications are also important to them. So list those certifications on there if they're relevant. If you've gotten them, you have that piece of paper that shows that you have gotten that certification. But small business certifications aren't the only ones that you want to list on your capability statement. So if you have a specific certification for your industry, so Urban Foresters is a tree company. So it's important for them to have a certified arborist. And they also have a ISA tree health assessment. So this showcases that they are experts in their field of trees. So certifications that you often see, these are some of your small business certifications, your national NSMDC or supp National Supplier Minority Development Council. Uh, WeBank is also a national certification for women-owned business. Um, and then of course, there's some city ones. Um, so look in your area and see what certifications are available. And if it makes sense for your company, go ahead and make those, uh, submit applications for those certifications. Here are some additional industry certification, Microsoft certified, QuickBooks, Six Sigma, HR certification. So what showcases your company? What certifications that make you above some of your competitors? Now let's talk a little bit about social media. All right, so when we develop a capability statement um, for our soft copies, the ones that are gonna be um, sent out electronically, we'll make them interactive. So people can actually click on social media links and it opens up that person's or that company's social media page. However, I strongly encourage you to take a look at your social media before you do that. Make sure that's something that you want a potential client to see. If not, maybe clean it up a little bit before you put those links on. Trust me, I've opened up some and went, oh no, not appropriate. All right, we are going to make our next switch. Please, we want to hear your questions. So drop those in the Q&A and Emily's going to come talk about services. All right, guys, we're getting some great feedback in the chat and in the Q&A session. So keep them coming. Um, it's, it's exciting to see how interactive the session is. So we're excited to be here and, and talking with all of you. So um, next, we're gonna move on to services. The next piece of the capability statement. So um, the first and most important thing that we tell our clients is to focus. This is not the time to be all things to everyone. Um, what, is, what is your most profitable service? We don't want to ever be in a situation where somebody asks us, well, what do you do? Well, what do you need? That's not, the, that's not what we're going for here. We want to narrow down what you are an expert in, what you do extremely well, where is your profitability lies, right? So focus on the appropriate services that we're going to help you grow your business and help you reach your goals. So an example of how that can look on a capability statement, here we have um, a client that has put some keywords across the top, right? They're right up front and center 
right underneath that company logo. They tell you exactly what this company does without going into too much detail and making it hard to find those key pieces of the puzzle. But next, there's another section, right? So there's your opportunity to expand upon what that means. What does project management look like, right? What does subcontracting look like? That can mean a whole lot of different things to a lot of people. So there's your opportunity to list those services in a little bit more detail. But again, we wanna highlight those kind of top tier items to make sure somebody can take a quick look at your capability statement and know who you are and what you do. Next are your NIGP and NAX codes. These codes are going to tell buyers exactly what they need to know about the services that you provide. Again, these are not listed in numerical order. These are listed by profitability. So know your codes. We'll talk a little bit more about how to get these codes if you're not familiar with them in just a moment. But know your codes and list them by profitability. A lot of times when a vendor um, from a, I mean, excuse me, when a buyer is in their vendor registration system, they may search for a potential client or a vendor by your code. So you want to have your codes up to date. You want to know what they mean and have them listed on your capability statement and your vendor profiles. If they can't find you by this code, they're not going to know that you provide the service that they're looking for. So your codes are critical here. You may not have space on your capability statement for the definition of all of your codes. That's okay, know what they mean. Make sure that you know if somebody calls and say, hey, I'm looking for somebody who can provide you know, this five digit code, you know what it means, you know what you're advertising for your business and review your codes. We're gonna talk about code search now. Make sure you know what your codes mean and how to find them. These codes do get updated every now and then. Every once in a blue moon, we'll have a client come to us and give us some codes and we'll say that code has been out of use for, for years, right? It's been updated to this. So familiarize yourself with these websites we're gonna talk about here in just a second and make sure you're marketing your services accurately. So NAICS codes are provided by the North American Industry Classification System. Again, it is just a set of codes that categorizes what you do based on industry, um, type of service, and then the, the details of those service. You could be a wholesaler, you may be a consulting firm, right? There's a unique set of codes and there's a formula for how those codes are built. So um, Dawn's going to be dropping this link in the chat. You can go poke around, do some keyword search. If you know your codes, go check. Are they still being um, used? Is that still updated? Sometimes they may roll everything up into one and give it a new code and reallocate those details. So again, familiarize yourself, check on it, make sure you're, you're marketing yourself appropriately. And then NIGP codes. NIGP codes are a little bit different. They are more frequently used um, at the state and local level. And because of that, oftentimes those codes may be different um, based on where you're located. Great place to start um, is the National Institute of Government Purchasing Commodity website. And Dawn is going to be dropping that, but also check out your local comptroller's office. Different states do have different codes. Um, so just because you see a code on somebody else's capability statement or website and you think, oh, I do the same thing, don't assume that that code is for you. Do your research, find the accurate information. And then lastly, what industries do you serve? You may be able to serve a little bit of anything, right? You may have a really unique um, and, and broad um, broad covering product or service, right? But what is your goal? Where do you think the most opportunity is? If you're doing your research and you're finding the buyers who are buying the services that you're offering, you've identified some of these, right? You've narrowed down your goals and your top markets. Put that on there. If somebody want, if somebody picks up your capability statement, you want them to know who you are, what you do, and why they care, right? So if you really want to work in this example, K through 12, right? They want to see themselves reflected in your clients, in the work that you're providing. So narrow down those industries, include that on there. And again, think about what your goals are. Maybe this isn't exactly what you've done historically. Maybe these are your goals. Maybe these are the areas that are most profitable for you. That's okay. Just be intentional in how you list that. And then operations, this kind of piggybacks off of services, but where are you doing your work? So we've talked about what work you're doing. Where are you doing it? Um, Dash Pass is actually a referral from RFP School Watch. They provide their services worldwide, right? So that information is right there in that bottom bar 
of their capability statement. It jumps out. It's easy to find. You don't have to go and dig and see, are, you know, oh, they may not be located near me, but can they provide their services to me? And it's right there, bold. You may have different warehouse locations, plants, or off, you may be in different um, cities with additional offices. Here's an example of a client who's in two states, four cities, right? Again, bold at the bottom, easy to identify from the other information that's on the capability statement of where One Day Came is doing their work, where they provide their services. I'm gonna pass it back over to Susan um, to talk about why you, again, don't forget, put your questions in the Q&A. We want to get to them. All right, Don, I see a question in the Q&A for um, the RFP School Watch team. Can you go ahead and read that and see if Rick, Amy, or Jill want to answer that? Of course, absolutely. Um, we're asking, what's the average of RFP bids you send to clients per month? Oh, I'll go ahead and take that. So unfortunately, there's not a really clear cut answer for that because it depends so much on your market. Uh, it depends on the agency's time of year. Uh, some of the, you know, it just, there's not a, a set answer. You you may get 10, 15 uh, notifications one month and get, you know, five or six the next. It just, it really depends on what the agencies are putting out, what they're shopping for at a particular time of the year. The good news about RFP School Watch is we do a very in-depth search on a daily basis to find open and relevant RFPs that match your keywords and then send those to you on an immediate daily basis. So as we get those RFPs come in, we send them out to our subscribers right away. To be able to put a number on it, it's just, it's just so, it's such a variable that it's really hard to give it an exact number. I will say that if you are not getting as many as you think you should be getting, then it's time to give Amy a call and say, okay, let's look at my keywords. Uh, maybe I need to adjust those. So keep in mind that a lot of it is what you put into the system. Um, and so think of other words that you might use because it's what what is the buyer searching for? So keep that in mind as well. So make sure you keep continually updating um, your profile at RFP School Watch to get the best fit. All right, let's talk about why you. So as a government entity, a school district wants to know why they should do business with you. Maybe they already have a provider providing those services, so you need to convince them of why they need to take a chance on you. So some of the sections that kind of fall into this puzzle piece, your value proposition, your insurance, your reference references, and any recognition your company has gotten. So a value proposition may not fit on your capability statement. You're gonna see very few of the ones that we have samples of that have this on here. That doesn't mean you get to skip this step. It's still important to know your company's value proposition. As you're out and about marketing with this capability statement, you're gonna to need to give this, you know, explain to the buyer that you're meeting with, explain to the small business liaison, why, why you? Talk about your value proposition. When you're emailing it out, to someone, you want them to open your attachment. Put the value proposition in that email, make them want to open your document. It can be a little intimidating to start this process. Like how, how do you even like, what is it? Why am I doing this? How do I get started? So it's just a clear understanding of exactly what your company does, what products, what services, and what are the benefits and advantages to using your company? 
are using your product, using your services, not the features, what advantage does that school district get by using your company? Now, don't be extremely generic and say, oh, we have the best service. No, explain exactly why it is. Talk about low cost, talk about on time, talk about the warranty of the, the product that you're doing. Give them information of what makes using your product or service a low risk for them. So as you're kind of got your scratch paper out and you're starting to craft your value proposition, here's a couple of prompts. One thing that clients have, that is a happy, happy surprise to my clients that are doing business with me is, um, once a client is doing business with me, they discover blank. Or maybe when they hire for me this with for this service, in addition, they're going to get this as a part of that package. And then my company goes above and beyond. So start thinking about that. And again, even if it does not fit on your capability statement, it is still information that you need to have. All right, now let's talk about insurance. Everybody wants to know if you're doing business with, with my entity, my government entity, are you covered? Am I covered? Um, so put your insurance on there so that they know they don't have to come back and ask. And again, it's information that you're going to have to have when you fill out their vendor profile on their website because you have to have all that information to get paid. So do you have the insurance? So you get your certificate of insurance and start looking to see what is your general liability? What is your automobile? What is your umbrella, workers' comp, your professional liability or errors in admission if you're a professional service? And one insurance that we are seeing more and more entities request, cyber liability. If somebody hacks your computer and our information is on your computer, what, what, what is gonna be done about that? So those are some different insurance policies. Now let's talk about references. Who have you done business with that's gonna say great things about you? Not just a company name. Who am I gonna be able to pick up the phone and call and talk to or email to find out what services you provided for that company and how you performed? So every small business or every business needs at least a minimum of three references at all time. And those references are going to change as your company grows and expands. As Emily said earlier, a capability statement is easy to update. If you just finished a really great project and you might want, you might want to go in and update that capability statement with that person's contact information. That way, you're showing, showcasing the latest and the brightest, your flagship project. You don't want to list a reference that you've had on the same capability statement for the last 10 years unless you're still doing business with them. You can also get testimonials from them and have those on your website. So when people take your capability statement, they open up your website and they see all of these great testimonials. So how do you get one? Well, you're gonna have to ask them. You're gonna have to actually pick up the phone and ask somebody to write, be a reference, write a letter of test, uh, testimonial, or if you're responding to a bid, actually maybe put in that letter of reference. So let's think before you ask, is this a client that you want to do work with again? 
Small businesses sometimes have to fire a client. That's not one you want to list on your on your capability statement. Or you're happy, have you done multiple projects? Or are you still working with them? All of those questions that you need to ask yourself before you ask them to be a reference. And you need to let them know what they're going to be talking about. So any challenges, solutions, how you um, how you provided cost savings on schedule, how you provided you know additional support once um, there was uh, you know all of a sudden the entity was supposed to order a hundred products and they only ordered seventy five and there were twenty five short and you made sure that they got that extra twenty five before class started. All of those wonderful things that you do to make sure your client's happy, make sure that you're they're talking about that when they get that phone call. But warn them ahead of time. So let your reference know that you've listed them on their capability statement. The last thing you want is for the client to start getting all of these calls and you don't know, they don't know why people are calling. So let them know that they, you've listed them and just let them know that they're only going to be on there for two to three months and then you'll be, you know, you keep them updated so they're not being your only reference. So Donna's going to drop into the chat just a generic email that you might send someone. Of course, you're going to want to customize it a little bit, but it gets the information that they need. So let them know. All right, recognition. Small businesses work hard, and if they won an award, you need to kind of shout it out. Put it on your capability statement. Let people know whether the business owner or the company itself has won an award. Be proud of the work that you've done and the accomplishments that you've made. So here, um, Soledad has woman on the move. Outstanding International Consultant, and then Houston International by the Houston International Trade Development. Something she'd be very proud of. She'll also be updating her capability statement to list the fact that she is one of Houston's outstanding women. She was just given that award last week. Um, Noe has his company has several awards that they won for their design work. So again, you want to showcase that. That means that they have uh, designing for K through twelve space, and they do an excellent job. All right, any questions that we have, and um, before Emily comes up, go ahead and drop those in the Q and A. We're going to do a, another switch. And Emily's going to talk about experience and how you showcase that. All right. So we've talked about who you are and what you do. Now we're going to back it up. We're going to talk about all the different ways you can showcase your experience on your capability statement to strengthen your, your company reputation and to strengthen yourself when you're meeting buyers. So here's an example of a client that had worked with some really big names. Their client list was impressive, right? So we took this opportunity to throw some logos out there, Chevron, Caterpillar, University of Houston. These are all highly recognizable logos. So we're taking advantage of that. We're taking advantage of that brand recognition and we put it right there on their capability statement. Again, it's just backing up everything we've already said on that capability statement and proving that we stand behind our work and our clients trust us, and here's evidence. So your year's experience, right? Sometimes you may be a new company, right? And so like, for example, with this one here, this company's only been in business for nine years, but their team it makes up a combined more than 50 years experience in design and construction. Don't be afraid to lean into your team. Your team delivers your product. So even if you're new to your company, that doesn't necessarily mean you're new to the industry. So years in business and year in industry can mean two different things. Lean into that and sell yourself. It's a great example. 
Wilson Unlimited. This was a brand new company. He hadn't had any experience as this company. However, he had been working in the industry for more than 26 years. He had completed over 110 projects. So we listed that here under previous owner's experience. So again, anything that helps tell your story, anything that helps back you up with the services that you do and the reputation that you have built so hard um, to develop, list that here. All right, and then in addition to awards, this kind of um, it is similar. A lot of times there's a lot of overlap here, but when you're working with a school district, schools want to know that you're giving back to the community. A lot of these government um, agencies and buyers are highly involved in community development. They want to know what you are doing to support your community. This is an example of one of our clients who is actively involved in a children's service um, organization locally and also serves on the board of the local visitors bureau. So we put that information on here to show her dedication and commitment to supporting the community that her small business is proud to support. Um, somebody asked in the chat earlier about uh, co-ops. If you're part of a co-op, this is a great thing to put on there as well. Co-ops are very, very popular when working with school districts, right? So if you're not familiar with them, we can talk about them offline. But if you um, are familiar with them and you're a member of a co-op, absolutely. Um, this is something worth including on your capability statement. We're going to show just a couple more examples of the design before we move into marketing. It's a perfect transition. Um, to talk about branding layout templates, you'll see these are not overly complicated. These are just sharp, branded, well-designed documents that sell your company. Secure at Shredding, this is a, a, a fairly new client of ours that is working with school districts as well. Um, some great examples of how she's identified different services that she provides and all of her information down low. So she's got, she didn't wanna be limited to just shredding. So we took that top um, um, real estate at the very top of her capability statement to advertise that she does more than just shredding, even though her logo might lead people to think it's just shredding. A consulting service, we broke this down with their, um, their codes on one side and their contact information on another. Again, there's no wrong way to do it. It's just, we had a question about that as well, a certain template. There's not a specific template. It's really just about having the specific information and organizing it in a way that the eye naturally lands on those key pieces to help a buyer identify the questions that they have for working with your business. All right, we are about to move to our final section, which is marketing. I'm gonna pass it over to Susan one last time. All right, so we're gonna talk about being proactive, not just reactive. And let me tell you something, RFP School Watch helps with that as well. You're getting bids in your inbox and maybe that's not the perfect bid for you or it's not the perfect time for you to respond to that bid. You're going to want to use that information in that bid to help you develop some marketing, um, a marketing strategy, especially if this is a school district you really want to do business with. So you're going to find out who the buyer is. It's in the document. What are they buying? All right, well, this document might tell me, not tell me what everything that they buy, but now it's going to lead me to that procurement site or that website of that school district, and I'm going to find out who the buyer, what all they buy. When do they buy your goods and service? You're going to start developing a pattern with these bids. Like Rick said, some months are very busy months, and then some months you're not going to have as many bids. And that's because the way the schools work, they're off during the summer, they're not doing, they're not as busy, or they're planning their you know, at the end of the year, they're trying to use up all their money before the next school year starts. So that you're going to start developing a pattern and you're going to, to start seeing all of that based on how many bids you're getting. Um, and then you need to kind of do some research on why you even want to do business with that particular school district. So they're going to cut down your research time into a quarter. Like they're giving you so much information in your inbox. And you need to have um, 
you know, either you sat through and read it or you have um, someone in, on your team read through them, you're also going to find out what information they're asking for and help you kind of put some of that together so that when you have a two week notice to respond, you have all of your stuff already ready. We do encourage you to visit and register with that government entity on their website because you're going to email your capability statement out to that buyer that you've got their information from that bid that you got in your inbox. First thing they're going to do is you're in, are you in our database? When you do a follow-up phone call with them, that's what they're going to ask. Are you in our database? And that just means that's how you're going to get paid. Um, and that's how they're going to, you know, that's how they're going to find you. You found them. Now you want them to find you. It's sort of a cross pollination. All right. So how are you going to get, so you've kind of narrowed down some schools you really want to do business with. Like, you know, especially if there's schools in your area, like how are you going to get that information to them? Well. Um, you might want to attend an event. Uh, a lot of the school districts will do a meet the buyer event, or they'll do, um, they're at conferences. They're at um, an event that they're going to find a lot of small businesses. So go to those events, sign up, find out who's attending. Chambers are amazing um, places to meet potential clients, government entities. A lot of these different conferences and events will have what's called a one-on-one -on -one meeting or a meet the buyer meeting where you can go in and talk to that buyer for five, six, seven minutes. That capability statement starts that conversation. They can quickly glance through it and see what you do. Pre-bids. Someone ask about how to be a subcontractor. If that school district is having an in-person pre-bid, show up with your capability statement. You're going to find out who's playing in your sandbox, who your competitor is, and who you can actually do business with. Virtual pre-bid, that's great too. Sign up. Oftentimes, you will get a list of every person that attended that virtual pre-bid with their contact information. So, you know, and the great thing about the virtual ones, virtual ones now, you may be in Georgia and the pre-bids in, in California. Now you just do your time adjustment and show up to that pre-bid and hear what they have to say and get that information. Attend education events. All right. So we're here today at this webinar. We've got a couple of three, four more scheduled for the next few months. Show up, find out. Someone in the group today that may have dropped their information into the chat, you think, hey, I can partner with them. And don't be afraid to mail it. So we send out capability statements and very brightly covered envelopes so that they land on someone's desk. Because I don't know about you, my inbox is crazy, right? So they're going to get this nice um, colored envelope is going to make them want to open it. It's going to have a nice letter and a capability statement in there. Um, so it kind of gets in their hand a different way or, or an old fashioned way. All right, questions. We have about seven minutes, so we're going to close this up. So anybody have, Donna, any questions in the Q&A that we need to address aloud? There is not right now. We've, okay. we've been going through them, and thank you so much for everybody's um questions. Uh, we have had we've had we've had some engagement today, and that really does help us. Thank you so much for everybody who dropped a question, and thank you for the RFP School Watch team that was helping to answer some of those questions. All right. So in the chat, who has? at least one item that you want to do this week that we've talked about. So Emily, if you'll let me know if anybody drops anything in.
She said, one moment, please. All right, while you're thinking about that, um, we're gonna continue on. Donna's going to redrop the links for the RFP School Watch um, promo, as well as their sign up for sample bids. Again, I encourage you to take the time and check them out. If you're not already a part of RFP School Watch, again, saving time saves money. And hopefully you've learned, you've gotten some information today that makes you realize that there is a lot of different advantages to signing up. Here is our link to our um, YouTube channel. This presentation will be uploaded next week. And again, we have a lot of different information about certifications, about uh, client registering on the different vendor websites. So information that you can use um, as you start this process or as you continue to grow in the K-312 space. Our capability statement coupon. Again, you're going to email the hello at bdgvictory.com and use the code RFP0323 and Don is dropping that in the chat as well. Here are some of our upcoming sessions with RFP School Watch. I know that the April and the May presentations registration is already live. And we're gonna help you um, talk about the difference between formal and informal. And then we're going to help you be prepared to win a bid. So please take the moment, take a moment, get registered for those. Um, additional information will be coming out soon. All right, last link in the chat, we have a survey. Please take them a, just a few minutes of your time to fill out the survey. It's not gonna take you very long. This is how we improve our presentations each month. So please take a minute, help us out, fill out our survey. I'm gonna hop in and join Susan for a second. Um, seeing in the chat, a lot of people are having questions about um, do we have templates and samples? How did they get feedback on their capability statement? A lot of people um, who have capability statements already want to make some edits, have done some code research. So all good things are happening. Um, in the contact information that Dawn dropped, she can drop it again. There is a link to book time with us. Um, so if you want, if you want to get in touch with us, have a deeper conversation about how to improve your capability statement, maybe get a new one or just review what you already have. Uh, use that that link to book time with us. One of us would be more than happy to talk with you. So we do have templates for sale. Mm -hmm. um, and as well as we will do a review. The, the discount code is not good for the template. However, it is, you can use the $50 off for us to review your capability statement. So um, we can have that conversation one-on-one. -on -one. Just email the hello or book some time. Either one of those is going to get, well, actually it gets Emily. <laughs> and then we can go from there. I hope that helped. I hope everybody enjoyed today's session. Don, do we have any final questions that we need to address before we let everybody get back to their day? Um, I just have a quick one that's coming up in the chat. Uh, Trisha's asking about downloading all of the chat um, the chat file and that she's having trouble doing that. Will you all, because I know the little three dots in the bottom corner, it says save chat for me, but she says she, she can't find it. I do believe so I don't know if... host and um, panelists can download. So is there a way for us to get them the chat? Yeah, we, we can pull it out and we can share it. That's something that we can do after the session. So, you know, just let us know that you're interested in it and we'll download that because it did have a lot of great contact information and it didn't, didn't. Maybe that one of those um, people that dropped their information in the chat is the one that you need to either market to or do business with. 
Um, so we'll be happy to share that. You just need to let us know. Again, that hello at bdgvictory.com. One of us will get that information to you as you know, as soon as we get that. All right, it is 12.59. We made it right in an hour. Um, thank you again for sharing your time with us today. We greatly appreciate um, you taking just an hour out of your very busy schedule to be with us. Um, we're always available. You catch us on our social media, catch us on our YouTube again, or just give us an email and give us a shout.